to start my story by sharing with you something that I came across recently. It really was kind of a, a shocking piece of work that I thought needed some reinforcement and discussion to really look at how education looks in classrooms and how we might want it to look for the future. So I saw this assignment that was designed for students to collect information about aquatic species, prepare a PowerPoint presentation, and the teacher had really scaffolded all the steps in the project to doing it. In fact, if you read the instructions, it said, you will do the organism that I, as a teacher, select for you. And there was a list of organisms. And then it went so far as it gave a step-by-step -step set of what you were supposed to do as a student. You would make a slide with the organism's common name. And if you did that, you could get up to two points for that. And uh, if you classified it, and you didn't even have to figure out what the classification is, there was the list already provided for you, a jawless fish, the cartilaginous fish, you can earn up to three points for that. And I said to myself, it seems somewhat problematic. It's not what we're looking for in education. It was a big question for me, because we had taken all the responsibility for thinking away from the student. We had looked at something and said, you don't need to think about anything. Just go out and find facts that I deem important, put them together, and present them in the way that I said to present them. All we were looking for from the students to do was to regurgitate some isolated information that someone else had determined was important. And I thought, that really wasn't what we want from our students. We want them to be better problem solvers. We want them to think about problems in a more sophisticated way. And it got me to thinking about my children. Because my children like to be inquirers. And I define inquiry very simply. It's about learning by questioning and investigation. Ask a question and figure out how to solve it. And you know, that's very domain non-specific. I'm a scientist and a science educator by trade, but anyone can be an inquirer. And uh, I want to tell you a little story about my daughter, Maggie. Now she's eight in this picture, but I want to tell you a story about when she was three. And Maggie, she liked chocolate milk. And uh, mom would make her chocolate milk and she'd drink her chocolate milk. To this day, she drinks milk by the gallons. Not so much chocolate anymore, but she loves her milk. And so one day, Maggie decided, unbeknownst to any of us, that she wanted to make her own chocolate milk. So she went into the kitchen. We didn't know this was going on. She brought a chair over. She got her materials necessary to make the chocolate milk. She, uh, she didn't know it was milk you were supposed to use. She used water instead. Maybe that's also because she could reach up to the refrigerator dispenser and get the water out of the refrigerator dispenser. She put it all together and she made herself her own drink. She didn't require anything from us to do this. She did it on her own. She had a question. She wanted to figure out how to do it and she did it herself. <laughs> This is instinctual in children. They love to ask questions. They love to try to figure things out. When my kids ask me, Dad, what will happen if I mix this dirt with Sprite? I don't know. I know. Go find out. And it's a good thing. We want children to be doing these types of things and getting excited about their learning because we want it to be more than just the factual knowledge that might be associated with a discipline. We want to think about problem solving. And problem solving can be across any domain, and it's got some essences and features. We want appropriate approaches, proof and documentation. Who can argue these are not things that we don't want children to learn? The problem is, with many students today, and I think we've kind of made this culture happen in education, is students say, just tell me what you want to, me to do. You say jump, I say how high. Children are being programmed by the educational system 
to do things the way we want them to do them. And I think we have to get away from that idea of telling students what to do and encouraging them to figure it out for themselves. Now, if we think about inquiry, there's really kind of three ways that this can happen. And the first is structured. It's the cookbook approach to learning. We look at students, we say, this is the problem. These are the step-by-step -step methods to solve it. When you're done, this is the answer that I might already know. And then you report it back to me. If we can step away from that a little bit, maybe we can move to more of a guided approach, advance the way we look at problem solving. And in a guided approach, maybe just the question is asked, but the means and the ways that the students solve the problem becomes much more open. They can design the strategies, they can come up with the ways to figure out the solutions, how to interpret the information, and draw the conclusions that are important. But what really excites me, and what gets me passionate, is the idea of it being open. Why, as educators, do we have to pose all the questions for students? Why can't they pose some of those questions themselves? So now we're adding an extra dimension, and we're actually going beyond just problem solving. You see, when we, we allow students to develop the questions, we take it to the next level. And I like to call that problem finding. Now, in education today, I think we go any high school in the state, maybe in the country, we have lots of objectives focused around problem solving. We do a lot of work in problem solving in education. But what we don't do a lot of work in is problem finding. Finding those questions for investigation. I think what's exciting about problem finding and problem solving is that problem solving really gets at the heart of a lot of logical and analytical processes. But problem finding gets at creative processes. And that's something that educators will all say, oh yes, we value creativity. We think it's important. We like it. But then if we look at it in their classroom, it's a lie because we don't see those processes of creativity happening. Are students being asked to come up with their own questions? Are we giving them open options to study? That process is not as fully developed and nourished as the problem solving processes are. If we think of problem finding, we want students to be able to identify and determine questions. Then that's just not making a list of questions and saying, here's my list. It's recognizing what the limitations and resources are associated with the problem finding process. What do you have? Do you have the expertise you need? Can you get the expertise you need? Do you have access to the people that can help you in the process? It becomes a much more holistic approach to learning. And because of that, students often think about relevance. And that brings a lot of meaning to the process. Relevance to work is so important because it puts it all together in the student's mind. You know, Einstein has a lot to say about problem finding as well. He says the formulation of a problem is often more important than that of its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. But to raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires imagination and marks real advances, and in his case, saying science. Now we can look at what the business community is looking for and what do they think is important. They think problem solving and creativity and innovation are critical skills that students need for success. How are we nurturing those processes in our schools to promote that type of behavior in them, to give them the independence they need to be successful, not only in their educational processes, but in their work and in their life to follow. Now, I think it comes down to two things, whether questions are well-defined for students or ill-defined. And when we think about ill-defined, that it might have a negative connotation to it, but to me it has a very, very positive connotation. Because when questions are well-defined, 
generally, the outcomes are known as well. And why do we always have to know the answer? How many problems have you identified in your life, in your learning, that were easy to solve if they were real? How many of them had all the information laid out for you ahead of time so you knew what you needed to do to solve them? Pick those three pieces of information, plug them into something to get the well-defined outcome. That's not how it works. Problems are ill-defined. The resources are not always there. You need to define things in ways that are unique, open-ended, and not deemed to have one possible solution. When you have an ill-defined question, an ill-defined problem, then there are so many divergent routes to get there. And it might not be one method to get there as well. There might be hundreds of ways to get there. The asynchronous, nonlinear patterns are so important to learning. And as educators, we need to challenge ourselves to be willing to let processes like problem finding and problem solving go forward so that the ill-defined questions that students want to ask, they can learn in a nurturing environment which promotes their independence, their creativity, and their problem solving skills so that they can become the learners and the thinkers of the future and they can be our hope for the success that we hope them to have. Thanks very much.